I told you this too that that I, I told a number of people you know in contemplating you know interviewing Louis Douthat it's like I thought I only have to prepare three questions <laughs> no, really um, but I want I want to get back to the beginning so to speak so you came to OSF and you famously said that you had never studied Shakespeare never never taken a class in Shakespeare so when you got here as that young woman <laughs> what did you make of Shakespeare? Well, he was paying the bills. <laughs> right? I got it. He's royalty free. I'm like, oh, great. Look, uh, right? It's true. He was paying the bills. He was paying for my job, which was great, so that I could go out and scout and find new work. <laughs> Shakespeare was a new playwright once, too. Right? And Shakespeare doesn't get to be Shakespeare unless he was produced. He, did not, he would not get to be Shakespeare. Now, lucky for him, he happened to be attached to a theater. He happened to like make a lot of money, apparently, you know, by being attached to that theater. And so, perhaps they had to do his work. I don't know. You know, there's that. You, you know, you got to hire the, <laughs> you know, right, the producer's girlfriend in the chorus. Okay, <laughs> maybe, maybe there was a little of that going on. I don't know, but his plays were pretty dang good. But, um, um, but boy, the difference between two gentlemen of Verona to the Tempest, for instance, if you sort of, you know, early-ish, late-ish, right? And you can lop off, you know, whatever. We can have that game if you want. Does it really kind of matter in a way? Except to sort of watch the career of a writer over 20 years. And that career is because he learned how to um, code things for time and space. That it had to be enacted in 3D. He, he learned how to do it. It's the only way to be a playwright. I mean, you can, be, you can write for TV, and that's not three-dimensional, by the way, right? TV and film is not three-dimensional. You have a different skill set. So if you want to write for this kind of thing, you actually have to be able to practice it. You can't just do it, you know, in your basement by yourself. You just can't. You don't learn. You don't learn proportion. You don't learn weight. You don't learn rhythm. You don't learn how this feels. Now, the beautiful thing about Shakespeare, of course, is that he has heavily poetic, right? So he was able to use that. But he also understood dramatic action. And until you see it happening in front of you, you, you know, we don't know. You can't define it because Aristotle didn't define it yet or we haven't found the urn, you know, uh, that he would define what. But we know it. We know when it's not there, when the play is like kind of doing this, treading water, right? Not going anywhere, right? We've all been to those. So. I already forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you did answer the, f the next question already, Excellent. too. So. I'm on it. I'm on it. All right. One of the things, one of the things I've, uh, sticking with Shakespeare for a minute. It, oh, right, Shakespeare, yes, right. yes. One of, well, one of, one of the things that, I, that, that you're famous in my mind for is something you said about, that, that, that pertaining to Shakespeare's genius, that in Shakespeare's case, at least, genius isn't doing something that's unprecedented so much as it's doing what everybody else does, only doing it better. Yeah, I don't think genius exists in a vacuum. Right. So what's the significance of that as it applies to Shakespeare, and how does that further our understanding and ability to appreciate the poetry and the rest of it? Well, I'll go right back to dramatic action. The, the guy understood that things had to happen. I mean, it's not basic. It sounds kind of stupid when you say it. But drama means action, right? Mm -hmm. And so in a place, something's got to happen. Now, you could argue whether anything happens in Waiting for Godot or not. <laughs> Other than time passing, that is true. And that was sort of the great experiment in the mid-20th century, was it not? To sort of play with components like that. But there is not a Shakespeare play that does not rely on the, a key and simple dramatic action. Starts as comedy, ends as tragedy. Stars and poetry ends. I mean, really, you could go down the thing. I'm happy, I'm sad. I'm and it seems so bad. You're like, really? He's like, yeah, really. Because you don't write 38 plays or however many plays in 20 years ish, right? Without having a kind of sense of sort of how to put those things together like that. And within that, every one of those forms is different. Mm -hmm. Now that's where the genius yeah. is. Yes, they put them in the three categories seven years after, you know, like. I, uh, I'm grateful to those guys, and I'm a little annoyed with those two guys. And those two guys, I mean Hem Hemings and Kondo, for putting together, uh, all, gathering all the plays together and, and printing them. I mean, obviously, that was magnificent what they did. And 18 of those plays we wouldn't have had. Right. So that's, that's awesome. And then, that, but the hard part is they put them in three categories. And it's like, well, you know, all the plays are actually a little bit different. 
So we sort of invent this sort of um, tw tweeting size, you know, genre thing that fits on the bulletin, you know, in the brochure, and you're kind of you're narrowing opportunities to enter the play rather than expanding them, right? Because if you take all those six er, comedies, or however many you want to, like the ones that we keep repeating every three years, you know, the, you know those ones. <laughs> they're actually very different. Yes, there's similarities, just so you kind of know it's the same guy writing in a way. Didn't I hear that speech before? I was like, yeah, like last year, you know. <laughs> because his philosophy of life doesn't really change. No matter what the genre is, the man's philosophy of life, just as August Wilson's philosophy of life did not change, right? And you, you listen to those 10 plays, you kind of go, I know I heard that speech before. I said, I know you did too. It was in the decade before, you know. But that character, because it's about who they are and what they get to put into it. So uh, it, 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 it appears that it was a period of great playwriting activity. You know, I don't know if it was like everybody was in on the act, or, but there just seemed to be a lot of people writing. All of a sudden, the professional playwright emerges in this period. It's actually important to go to the theater or to be seen or what, you know. Uh, 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 you look through the history of, of um, you know, theater history, and there are pockets where it was really important and fun, and then it doesn't last all that long, and then you get some other um, art form that becomes sort of the potent thing, or, or, or it's, you know, Paris in the 20s. You know, that doesn't last forever either, right? But So you've got a little of that going on, and he is just in a, it's happening around him. Mm -hmm. There's no way he comes up with this on his own. And he's so. getting the, the acknowledgement at his time, too, as well as now. Yeah. To some extent. To, to, yes, to our knowledge, yeah. Um, I want to move into dramaturgy a minute. Thank um, God. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you said to me that, that the only thing you're concerned with as a dramaturg is, is structure or how the play is being told. First of all, are those the same thing? The structure and how the play is being told? Is that the same thing to you? No. Okay. No. So the difference would be um, the structure is sort of the bones of it. Uh, so think of an amusement ride. Right. Right? So it's got certain da da da. But how it's being told is how fast and how slow and what's the cart and right? So right. They're, two, they're two different things. Right. So the bones of the play would be something really kind of uh, like how many acts is it? How many characters are in it? What, you know, wh where's it going to go? Like, oh, we're going to go, uh, we're literally going to go into the forest and we're going to come back and there's going to be some redemption. Oh, excellent. But how? Two character scene, three character scene. Oh my God, there's a big fat scene, a sword fight. Yeah. That's how. Right? That's not structure, that's how. Right. So you're really concerned with two things then? Yes. Yes. What standards or methods do you use? I hate him right now. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when, when, you're, when, you're <laughs> when you're looking at that, at that question though, how should this story be told? What are the standards or, or method you use to sort of come up with the answer to that? Well, uh, kind of going back to components, right? Uh, every play is made up of pieces and parts. So what are those pieces and parts? So it's mostly, I mean, it's sort of a straight, very boring analytical thing. It's like I actually catalog like how many two characters, you know, how two character scenes. And like, you know, you could chart the whole play of Hamlet by the soliloquies, actually. It's very interesting if you do it. And you kind of go, oh, there's where the thing just turned. Excellent, you know. Um, and that just kind of continuing to look in uh, um, to the different layers till you get to bone, um, to sort of see how things are lined up, that, that it must, and it gives information about what's important. If something's only kind of done once in a play, you think, eh, it's just sort of fodder, you know? So, like a, so you get to the important thing. But somebody says the word honor 30, you know, or, or the 36 times or something in Troilus and Cressida. I'm making that up, but you, you know. We could all look it up if we had to, but you get my point. About sort of like it's like, ooh, could that be what the play is about, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Every and you look to see does every character use the word, mm -hmm. for instance, because then that's different than you know I keep saying the same thing. Oh yeah, Louis is going to talk about structure now. Yada 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 yeah. But if you started talking about structure, I'd be like, oh, that's interesting. Do you know what I mean? You always got that one person that always says the same thing all the time. But if you're the advocate for them, all of a sudden it has different weight. So if you, you look to see like themes and stuff, if every character kind of carries that along, you kind of go, hmm, that may be something to pay attention to that may be very mm -hmm. potent. And it may be con conscious. Consciously, 
I mean, assuming some consciousness when he's writing these things, it couldn't have all just been, you know, 2 a.m. after the bar closed. But <laughs> I'm sure there was a fair amount of that. But I'm assuming sort of a, the sort of joyful, gleefulness of, of um, his, so fluid with, with uh, poetic structure and, and, and telling stories in that, in that very formal form, right? It's a form. It's a formal form. And even in the 20 years of his lifetime, it doesn't last. Right? Plays toward the end, get more and more um, uh, prose, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I have been known to say that The Tempest is the first contemporary play yep. because it's one actor, one role. That's not true of what happened you know, earlier in his career and the prose of, of, of it, the, the high level of his prose. Of it. So it's sort of interesting that way. Well, it, and it, it, t it relates very directly to what you were talking about in terms of, of symbols. And yeah. it, when, when you see a symbol right. or, or a clue that keeps coming up, coming up in different contexts, you recognize that there is, in fact, some significance to it that is more than what is on the page. Right. And then you want to do an assessment of that. And then you talk to the director to say, hey, what do you think? Blah, blah, yeah. blah. You could really make, have a field day with this because it's blah, 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 blah. You talked before about elements. and, and one of the questions I've always wanted to ask you is, is when you look at a play's structure, how do you see or how do you think of the relationship between what arguably are the two primary elements, character and narrative? Or is, is there a dynamic tension uh, or equilibrium inherent in, in, in a play, a good play, uh, between stories, the story and the characters? Well, Aristotle was said they were practically the same thing, uh, that they had equal weight them in terms of sort of being broken into pieces and parts. And I, kinda, I think I tend to agree because what we're watching is characters in action, mm -hmm. right? Somebody does something and then there are consequences for those actions. It's very simple in a way. And then he was sort of working out those consequences. You know, Lear asks, you know, which of you, you know, uh, loves me best? Uh, in a public place, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we spend the rest of the play watching him learn what the answer is. Right, everything gets set into motion in that. Right, so uh, I think they're probably of equal weight. And of course, when when Aristotle was looking at plays, he was looking at plays that didn't have so much spectacle like we do today. We, I mean, we have a lot of goo, right? We got a lot of goo that goes on the sets, and that's really fun. Sets and costumes, and but they, as far as we know, there wasn't that much goo. As far as we know, there wasn't that much goo in Shakespeare's time either. You know, I mean, I think there were some, you know, capey things, right? And, <laughs> but really, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Not much, you know, compared to today, right? So that's also pieces and parts of the way we have to look at plays, you know, from 400 years ago or 2,500 years ago, or even Moliere, uh, or uh, Chekhov, you know, 115 years later. It, uh, that everybody had a different convention that they all see, which is also a kind of pieces and parts um, mm -hmm. assumption. So I'm trying to figure out on two dimensions how what's how something to describe, what does it feel like in my mind if I make the model uh, in my head. Do you know what I mean? And then I have people kind of moving around, see, see how that butts up against one another. I mean, all, um, in a good play, everybody's right. And so that's how the conflict happens, right? That's how the moral conflict happens. And uh, it's the working out of that, which would be character in action, that would make for, I think, a satisfying play. You were the dramaturg, you were the dramaturg for last season's Animal Crackers. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. Such as it was. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Tell us about your presentation at the first production meeting of that play. What were you wearing? Oh. <laughs> Well, okay. Um, we were, um, you know, there are many threads in plays, right? If you stop any play at any moment, and I can say this to you guys because we're all of a certain age, in the VCR era, um, if you stop something in the sort of what this synchronic way, like you put the pause button on, right, on your VCR, you could, there's at least 14 pieces of, at least 14 pieces of information. I'm going all the way back to semiotics that we, you could get about where we had come from, where we're about, and, and who's doing what, when, when, where, how, why they're wearing, blah, blah, blah. You know, someone's in purple, must be the king. And what's going to happen next, right? That's the idea, okay? 
And in Animal Crackers, which I assume many of us have seen the movie. Did everybody see, did many of us see the production last year too, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, so we spent a little bit of time trying to put some sort of ardent social criticism in there. <laughs> so, um, it's in there, they swear to me it's in there. So um, Mark saw it. Yeah, Mark saw it, somebody saw it. Um, I think it was even in the playbill or something. But, um, you know, there, there are class issues. I mean, the an an anarchy of that of those those boys invading that Long Island, you know, household uh, of a certain class and sort of wreaking havoc over the weekend and sort of what, who wins? You know, there's another great kind of formula to ask about plays. You know, what two forces are in conflict? Who wins? And to what effect? So, uh, looking at sort of like the uh, Mrs. Rittenhouse and the boys, like here are the two forces in conflict, representing, right? Uh, and the madness that was called Animal Crackers and who wins at the end. And I, my, I said, well, she won. The house is still standing and she gets rid of them, <laughs> right? She gets rid of them and, uh, you know, right? Yeah. So, um, I decided to uh, emphasize the class aspect of the play. And I came out in um, a debutante dress <laughs> and proceeded to give a very formal lecture about, you know, the importance of what was happening in Animal Crackers in its social critical, uh, in a social critical kind of way. And uh, about halfway through, John Tufts uh, unpacked a um, shaving cream pie and came up and smashed it into my face. It was planned, however. <laughs> I knew it was going to happen. I asked him to do it. But I thought it was going to be whipped cream. So that was a little bit of a shock. <laughs> and I had put my glasses on because I thought, you know what, I really don't want any right. of this in my eyes. Right. But uh, yeah. So that sort of stopped proceedings for a while. And that seemed to be like what the Marx Brothers was about, right? So there it was. It demonstrated it. Yeah. Brilliant, too. <laughs> I, I understand it was the actual debutante dress that you had worn when you came out. In yeah, Ohio. well, that's a whole other <laughs> shenanigan story. <laughs> well, the point. That's I, about as Marx Brothers as you get well, that whole I, event. I, I, I think the point for some of our audience is that it still fits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it did still fit. Um, before we leave dramaturgy, I want to ask you you recently um, worked at the Magic. Theater with your uh -huh. with your friend Loretta Greco, yeah. um, and you were the dramaturg for a play called Annapurna by Char White, who I think is also a friend of yours. Yes. Um, when you work at another theater, do you work differently than you do here at OSF? Yes and no. You have to enter every play uh, as if it's a new play. That that seems like an obvious thing too. Although I have worked on uh, Streetcar Named Desire elsewhere, and you know the Shakespeare plays to a certain degree, they're all. And we all know, they're new to me anyway, but you really have to kind of think of them as new. Um, and the resources at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival are, are um, you know, sort of extraordinary. So you work differently in a way. There's only so much they could afford of my time, to be kind of crass about it, mm -hmm. uh, and my own time even just pulling away out of, out of the madness here to go down there. Um, but I had known uh, Char because we had done a play called The Other Place, which got a lot of press about a year or so, within this last year on, on Broadway with um, Laurie Metcalf in the lead role. And it was a beautiful, beautiful uh, four-character piece that we had read in uh, Black Swan Lab, which is my um, uh, development um, wing uh, that, I, that I helped produce uh, at the festival. And so I had gotten to know him that way. And it, I, I loved the play so much I had asked for us to consider it. And it didn't make it, obviously, in the season. But so I knew his writing uh, really well. He's very much... Uh, the structuralist in him and character. And, and lot, not unlike many contemporary writers, he was an actor first. I, I, I dare say, if you poll the writers that you all are reading, I bet a vast majority of them were actors first, or, or still are actors, like Tracy Liss, yeah, for instance, yeah. right? So that's sort of interesting. So that whole character and action thing, they're really all yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So you're getting a lot of character studies now, right? And they may be set, you know, in strange places, but I'm just saying there's, there's this character actors, which I think has to do with, with that. Um, basically, I um, was advisor. There are four major roles for the dramaturg. Now, the thing is that uh, I'm not the only one that does these jobs. This is why it's confusing. That's why I have to every day say, yes, I'm really vital, even though I'm doing 
I, I'm not doing it, you know, you're doing the, my job, but I'm really vital. So <laughs> there are four basic jobs. One is the playwright's friend. The other, uh, another one is being the play's advocate, which can be different. Uh, the fool for the director, if they allow it, you know, they have to be very strong to allow me to sort of like dance around and say, you know, all kinds of nasty things to them, but what they're not doing. And then um, audience, ear, and eye, right? And so again, it's not like I'm the only one doing this, but that's sort of what I hold. First the, audience, too, right? Right. Yeah, well, audience, yeah. eye, and ear, yeah. So even for the magic, working with Loretta, it would have been uh, more like help her. I right. would have helped her. Right. You know, I, I, I think I had to do something for the program which I don't often do here, which was kind of fun. I did an interview with Char White, I think. And then um, I think I was there for the first read or something, but really more like her pal. Mm -hmm. So that was my function in that particular okay. um, uh, assignment. Okay. Um, you call yourself, the, you, you refer to yourself, Lydia refers to you, as when, when, when Louis got here, she, she was the new playgirl. It's yes. a phrase you've used often. Yes. What did that mean to you when you got here? As being, I mean, okay, I'm the new playgirl. What does that mean? That okay, that how many people here read for the Ashton New Place Festival? <laughs> okay, you've got those stacks at home, correct? I walked into 1,500 scripts. Yeah. That's what new play gal meant. I read scripts for eight years. And then finally, I think Barry said he couldn't do much ado or comedy. I don't know which one the comedy, I don't know which one it was. I can't really remember. Right. He said, oh, I can't, there's nothing more. It's two gents, maybe. Or something. I can't do that anymore. There's nothing in those comedies, something like that. And I said, well, I'll do it. I thought, what the heck? So that's what started the whole career okay. in that way. But I read, I mean, I probably was reading something like 600 scripts a year. <laughs> what was and they were just coming. I mean, this, uh, and this was before the internet, right? Right. So they're I mean, and then you have to return them, you have to write a letter, and you have, you know, I mean, it was a lot of, a lot of, they were just coming. And even though, I mean, I was a playwright once, too, and I remember thinking, why would I send a script to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival? I think that's kind of silly, right? But um, we had done a play in the mid-80s, apparently. We had commissioned a play, Stuart Duckworth, I think was his name. And it was very successful, and we kind of wanted to begin to do that. And it was also in the mid-'80s when all these scripts started to, be, it started to be circulated around regional theaters, right? So that there was a shift in sort of regional theater focus from sort of, you know, uh, doing um, sort of like a, a standard uh, repertory, although they still do. But there were a lot of scripts being writ uh, written, and they were, you were submitting them, you know. Even if the theater didn't have a submission policy, people were submitting them. They were showing up. So I was like, well, what are we going to do with them? <laughs> so I, I sat in a corner and I read for like eight years the scripts. And I sent back letters. And you know what? Not one of them got anywhere. So it's disheartening, right? Yeah. You know, oh, yeah, OK, occasionally I could pick one up a pile and we did a reading. We used to do more readings than we do now. So occasionally, but none of them got produced. None of the plays at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. None of the plays I read got produced at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. So uh, you kind of have to wonder about that whole system. But it was just, um, you had to do something with them. Yeah. Look, it, oh boy, it takes more energy to write a play that actually is unsuccessful, in my opinion. <laughs> Why is that? that? Because you're working so hard to make it work. <laughs> And I believed that every script deserved to be read from beginning to end. And uh, I wrote a personal letter. Now I had my standard paragraphs. <laughs> but I remember sending a script to the Playwright Center in Minneapolis years ago when I was writing. And I got back a Dear Playwright letter. And I thought, if the Playwright Center can't even personalize it, what, that makes no sense to me. So they were all personalized. I signed them all. Um, I sent back a lot of, of plays. Now, it's a fine line to walk because you don't, you know, I don't exactly want to encourage conversation about it. <laughs> Just when I say, did I read it really well? You know, like on page 78, did you get the point? It's like, oh, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> so, uh, but I wanted them all to be read. So we spent a lot of time, and I had a reader, Mark Murphy, for years was my reader. A magnificent reader wrote great bo uh, book reports, play reports, 
And I had a couple others over the years. But I wanted them all to have the honor of being read, you know, th to respect the effort. Mm -hmm. And that took a lot. Mm -hmm. And we don't do that anymore because it just takes too much. And it, we're, we're, ov we're overwhelmed, as I think that you all can understand. Um, and we're also developing so much of our own work, and that's where most of my energy is going now. I, I want to talk about that next. I, I did some research. And between the years 2005 and 2009, yeah. OSF had five world premieres. If you count Tracy's Tiger, which the festival sort of doesn't, it doesn't list it as a world premiere. We don't. No. That's sad. Um, okay. Two of them were done in the same year, the first year of that five-year period, 2005, uh, by the waters of Babylon and Gibraltar. In the next five years, counting next year, from 2010 to 2014, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival will have 14 world premieres. Wow. That's no wonder I'm tired. That's more. <laughs> wait a minute. That's more than ACT. Marin Theater Company, Berkeley Rep, mm -hmm. and the Magic Theater. Berkeley Rep and the Magic Theater are known for being companies that produce world premieres. Yes, if, but proportionally, the Magic does three out of five. It's true, okay. but if you look, if you remove the Shakespeare plays from the uh, yeah. season, right, it represents forty percent of the plays over a five-year period that OSF has done. This surprised me. It, yeah, it, it, and me it surprised Lydia when I talked. Yeah, to yeah, her. yeah. So my question is, while the American history cycle obviously is one big reason for this, yeah. in a larger sense, what's the philosophy or the thinking behind this relatively new commitment on the part of OSF to developing and producing new plays? Well, uh, the American Revolution definitely is driving um, that to, to a certain degree. I mean, this is a huge, ambitious project to commission up to, be careful of this language, right, up to 37 plays uh, about moments of great change in American history. Now, we're fully aware that we're not going to produce all 37 of them in the however long 10-year whatever cycle right. that you, we're just not going to. It may seem statistically like we're headed that way, <laughs> but we're, not, we're actually not going to because um, variety still matters a lot uh, at the festival. And, and the, the interesting statistic to me is, uh, curiously, uh, this year, there's no contemporary story. Yeah. Right. All, these new, all this new work, not contemporary story. That's interesting to me, too, right? So all plays are history plays at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival in an interesting way. And it's partly driven because of the American Revolution. Now, that said, in some ways, like the four Shakespeare's that we are, that we will be producing every season, I, I think it's pretty fair to say that unless there's just nothing remotely, you know, like Pluto even, in the universe, um, we will, oh, you know, we will be producing an American Revolutions play every year too. So there's five already kind of done in a way, right? And and uh, we've all of a sudden hit an interesting pocket because I'm commissioning musicals and uh, uh, what I call the gap commissions, um, and we have about seven projects ready to be produced for 2015. Hmm. So we could just do four Shakespeare's and seven new plays and be done. <laughs> But that's not enough variety in a way, too, yeah. right? You want to touch base with, again, I'm going back to components. It's really interesting to look at what, how Streetcar Named Desire is built because it had different sort of component, has different energy, a different component, and there's something about getting a sense for what that was. Do you know what I mean? Like, we have to work a little harder at it. And somebody could tell that story in contemporary uh, language, perhaps, and a contemporary structure and by the pieces and parts that we're used to. And no doubt it would include video, which as you all uh, may have seen. I mean, that, that has been an element that has popped up about as fast as electric lights did, you know, at the end of the 19th century. You know, all of a sudden that is a major theatrical player that we have to contend with. And an important and fun one, really. But, you know, that, that's really very recent. But, so it's fun to have that challenge as well, you mm -hmm. know. So variety, I go back to sort of variety. Now, um, why are we developing so much new work? It's, it's partly because um, Bill likes new work and feels like that is a great counter, counterbalance or complement to the classical work. Mm -hmm. And so in that reflective way, you know, how are we doing? Or how's it feeling that in some ways that they can sort of talk to one another theatrically, aesthetically, thematically? Uh, maybe not you know point by point, but I think that there's something really interesting about that. Now you you know you could look at. 
I'm not obsessed with the world premiere thing, mm -hmm. but I'm more obsessed with sort of the contemporary and sort of new voice thing. And that for a long time we were doing second productions at right. the world premieres, which I took great pride in because it's harder to get a second production than it is to get a first production. And, and, and curiously, the second production is when I actually get to do more work mm -hmm. because uh, everybody's kind of done all the, they've tried to solve it mechanically. And, and you don't have a lot of time, so in some ways you have to sort of just throw some more, you know, red gel at it, you know, and just, you know, and you just say that faster. You know, I mean, there's not, just not time. But then you can kind of step back and you sort of been watching, as you may know, some of you may know that in, um, uh, even during The Unfortunates, which is going to run something like a hundred times, I mean, good grief, a hundred times for a new play that you can't do anything about, that you're learning in your body and that we're learning, you know. I think I've said this to you before, I sit behind you during the shows, because I watch you all sort of shift. I was like, oh, they're shifting. Mm. Got to do something about that moment, right? It happened at the Tenth Muse in the first preview. It was hilarious. <laughs> 600 people shifted at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it was in the second act. And I went, oh, we're going back in again. So I was like, oh, OK. We got to work on that repetition, right? So it was just really interesting. But I loved the year that we did Top Dog and we did um, uh, Raisin in the Sun. Right, the mm -hmm. conversation between two African American women writers, uh, two generations apart, right. and, and that was sort of, they didn't. I don't think they went head to head, maybe a little overlap, a and that was too bad because of programming. But I like that too, mm -hmm. right? So that that's part of it. And Phil loves loves musicals, and I think that we've got a lot of people who love musicals, and so we're developing musicals, and so I s suspect that um, we will do well. We are doing our our first commission musical next year. Um, with uh, family oh, album. Family album. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, and there's always the smattering of we need the adaptation of, you know, the novel, or we need uh, the translation of Chekhov, or we need just to have in our back pockets for, because we're a classical, you know, language based theater and, and classically oriented. So right. you need those kinds of things too. And translations have to be redone every seven years. That's a generational thing. Just has to. Language changes, we change. Or we don't. But it's kind of nice, to, it's kind of interesting to see how that could happen. But language changes really, really fast. So translating is often, um, you know, I kind of always have a couple of those in my back right. pocket, and I always got a couple of new plays. Uh, somebody strikes our fancy one way there. Or there's a lot of co commissioning going on, and co, you've maybe heard of co productions where two theaters sort of share expenses. And now we have theaters sharing expenses for the development and commissioning part of it, which is which is not a, no small uh, consideration. Um, and, they're, they're, and we want to broaden the demographic to a certain degree. I mean, that there is more, you've noticed this, there's more family-friendly programming. I mean, what is the har heart of Robin Hood, if not that, right? Designed to be and successful at. Now, you can argue whether you like that or don't like that, but that's what it was designed to do. And I, you know, it's kind of what we learned from Pirates of Penzance, which was just explosive. I mean, families were, I mean, it was great fun. You're like, what's wrong with fun? <laughs> so we're trying to put a little fun back in the festival, I guess. But um, there's a little of that and an interest in exploring other kinds of non dramatic literature as well as, as, as dramatic literature. So, is there a sense for you? By the way, in the Libby era, I had that many commissions. You did. It's just we didn't do them. Right. You know, I, was yeah. I always had six or well, eight it, every year. Well, it brings up an, the in, an interesting point of, that you were, I think, touching on at the end there, that there is a certain commercial component to this. I mean, every theater in Northern California, for example, is doing more world premieres than they've ever done. Yeah. As is as is OSF, as yeah. is the theater in, yeah. in Seattle. And yeah. it's clear that there is, that people want to see it. People yeah. come to see it. Yeah. Yeah. Although I think it's an interesting point which that you made about second productions because it just occurred to me that in a second production, that's where you get the chance to really explore the possibilities of a new work. Correct. Yeah, correct. Is there this a may just be a pendulum swing. Too. Yeah. Do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, like that's everybody true. Yeah. sort of going this way, new work, new work, new yeah. work, and then finally somebody's going to do like, and it's like, oh my God, this revolutionary. You right, know, the right. Fact that not well, I, when I saw MT, um, Marin Theater, the Jason the Marin Theater Company is doing yeah. two world premieres next yeah. year, I was like, oh right. my God, yeah, right. they've never done that. But is there a sense for you of having come full circle now with, with this? Yeah, new, definitely. Uh, and from it, the new play girl to what's so going on ironic, now? So ironic, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I was going to leave when Libby uh, retired. 
Because I thought, oh, well, you know, we're just, we haven't gotten to the new plays yet. Okay, so, um, and she said, no, you have to stay a year. You have to help Bill for a year. I said, oh, all right. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, and then he comes along, he starts talking about new work. And I was like, ah, oh, really? <laughs> so, and then he came up with this Black Swan Lab, and I was like, oh, boy. And he's such a nice man. It's like genuinely <laughs> nice. He's a man. She really is. And I thought, okay. So lo and behold, here I am, you know, X amount of years later. But um, it, and it's partly because the, it's ironic, of course, right? We're right back where I yeah, that's what I was hoped thinking. to have enter 20 yeah. years ago. Years ago. I want to talk about uh, how you uh, how you look at. Um, what this organization does for a minute, AMPF. Mm -hmm. How does an organization like AMPF contribute to this development of new plays that goes on? Oh my God, you're reading the plays. It's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Because so few of us are. I mean, that you're just honoring the effort? My God. It is there any harder writing than writing a play? I'm sorry. I just don't think there is. And I mean that in the sense of having something to say, putting it in a code, uh, you know, you, you try to figure out something that, you know, uh, will be told in an entertaining and deep and emotion, you know, have an emotional effect at the end. And that by God takes like 600 p plus people to actually do. 600 plus the 40 people on stage and backstage. So it takes 640 people to do. It's not like writing a novel, I'm not saying that's easy uh, at all. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that this is a different project, right? So the fact of the matter is that you, every fall, give energy to this enterprise is magnificent. Because where else would, how else would you have the heart to go on in sort of a Beckettian sort of way? I stopped writing plays because I was getting no support. Now, do I think I would have been a good playwright? No. But... Uh, it would I, I would have loved to have been uh, I would love to be 30 years younger right now mm. because we're in an era of great American playwriting again we really are now they may seem weird to some of us because structurally they, I mean the form is exploded and that's the beautiful that's the reason why I'm saying that because no revolution ever happened except by form it's really the content Right? Nothing human is foreign to me. And these plays are still about a human being doing something, and there are consequences for it. That's no different, right? So the fact of the matter is that you all, I mean, and I know that there, I don't know what the collective noun is, you know, a bevy of you. <laughs> uh, you know, that are dedicated. You guys, I know how much time you spend on. I know how difficult it is. I know what kind of heart and uh, expectation that has to go into it. I know the heartbreak, you know, and that you're willing to year after year after year. Awesome. It's awesome. And I thank you very much for it. I really do. One, it's of, the, one of the things that I've experienced and that other readers that I've talked to experience is there, it, it's almost like a drug when you, reach it, when you start reading a play and you go, oh, my God, this is effing good. Yeah, three times in my career. You go, yeah. <laughs> well, I can tell you what they were too. Three times in my career. How do you tell them? The, how, so for me, it's the, what I have to. What happens is I, I read something and it's just like I get this hit. Like this is good, and then I start to figure out why. How do you? While you're reading, you're figuring out why. No, after I read it. After I read it. First rule: don't stop. Do you look for a unique or distinctive voice? How do you tell? No, them? it doesn't matter. I don't know what the, it's not the same component every time. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, what it is, but after a little while, something pops or doesn't pop. I don't know what it is. Some character says something kind of went, what's up? I got to know more. Or something just happens. Or there was an interesting phrase. Or I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's not always, there's nothing, there's nothing prescriptive about it. What's prescriptive is that you got hooked. Somehow, the combination of those elements we've been talking about all evening are lined up in a certain way that grab you. And just because it grabs you doesn't mean it's going to grab your committee, right? So right. there's all that. Right. 
<laughs> I know where the real work happens. Yeah. It's at the committee level. You, you yeah, I know all that horse training that goes on. So, uh, but you got to start with somebody's got to have had an emotional hit about something. Right. Because I'm going to ask 600 people to have emotional hits about it. So you got to start with somebody having. It's like, whoa, that really meant something to me. That doesn't mean it's good, bad, I'm stupid or smart. Because there's a, I don't know, what the math would be and the combination of ways you could put things together uh, into the kinds of stories and the number of plays there could possibly be. I mean, you know, there's that guy in the mid-20th century who wrote the thing, said there were 36 dramatic situations. And, you know, I think he's kind of right. You know, you've got them down to like seven categories or something, and there's sort of stories off that's like, really? The combinations aren't that unique. It's how. So, yes. Am I looking for a unique voice? I'm looking for something that pops. I'm looking for somebody who has the courage to tell the truth as they know it. And that takes courage, you know? And lining it up with those pieces and parts are very complicated. And one slip here, one slip there could throw it all off, and we could miss it. You're also reading very quickly. I know that. I mean, I. I read at the pace that I would see it at. I don't read stage directions, and I don't read character headings, unless I get confused. Because you wouldn't take time seeing the play to read the description of what you're seeing. You know what I mean? And Because and I, I only want an emotional hit the first read. That's all I want. It shouldn't take longer than what you think it would take to read. Uh, see, rather. Right? So that's, a di so that's just sort of a me, because I want because uh, if I'm not, if I don't get emotionally engaged by it, I got 14 more that I have to read today. Right. right. You know, so you got to walk around the block, have a little, you know, palate cleanser, and dive back in again. You know. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it, it's um. I, I, yeah, I don't have a a say about. I don't know that I could say exactly what it was. I will say that it has to happen pretty early in the script. And that's only because um, they are finite events. They have form to them. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Every play has a beginning, a middle, and an end. I have huge arguments with my, you know, non-structuralist, uh, existential, you know, whimsical friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no. Every play has a form, and it's not life, which ha seems formless <laughs> some days, right? But it has, a it has a container around it. Now, we are playing with that container a lot, are we not? I mean, we have prologues now. You know, anybody see Imaginary Invalid a couple years ago? I mean, all of a sudden, Rodney's out there playing the accordion. You don't know who he is. And then he shows up on stage. And it's like, oh, that was fun. So that the, ex the event is being extended, right? You got the Marx Brothers, you know, doing whatever they were doing. You've got Mark Bedard in... Um, Serving the two masters, right. selling candy in the lobby at intermission, right? So you're extending, we're extending the event, but eventually it does end, mm -hmm. right? So you've got to get my attention quick. That's all. I mean, I'm, I'm, that may be my only universal law. Is, and, you know, um, Shakespeare, holy moly. Guys, the first two words of Hamlet, I think in all three versions, is who's there? And from that, question. It takes three hours and 45 minutes to solve. And it does. He has to take all that time to unravel everything that he just set up. Who's there? That's the first two words. I mean, Shakespeare didn't wait 20 minutes in, hoping that maybe you know, I'd keep give, you know, give you the benefit of the doubt that maybe you get somewhere finally. The whole theory about Moliere and the restoration plays that maybe it took a while for everyone to get there. They weren't trained well, i.e., the, the, the curtain didn't, you know, did not start on time. People were wandering in. And so if you read those restoration plays and, and Moliere, it's a really interesting theory to sort of think about that it isn't until about the third scene that something drops in. You kind of go, oh, that's what it's about. I have no idea what they've been talking about for two scenes. But oh my god, that's, well. It's possible it was the convention from, you know, 300 years ago. You see what I mean? Now, you could lop that all off, probably, in our, you know, like cut to it. Uh, people don't often do that, but you can, you should think, you know, that's all. It's just something that you have to think about. 
When you're reading, what's the context of what that was? New plays, you know, we're all kind of on an even playing field in a way by the kinds of components that one, one, one could use now. But it's really interesting to read it, restoration. I mean, I just died. Those, I was like, really? Are we going to, what are they? I mean, I know they're speaking English, but really? I mean, wow, it takes a long time. So that said, I think you, you got to hook me early. Mm -hmm. What does holding stage readings or, or public readings of new works, how does that contribute to the development of okay, new works? Okay, so there's work? different levels, right? You got somebody's um, germinal idea runs around. They call me up and say, Louie, I want to I want to write a play. What did I just hear the other day? It was sort of fascinating, but <clears throat> you know, I want to write a play about whatever whatever it is. And what, what do you think of the idea? And this is gonna happen. But it's like, okay, great. So go write that play. So uh, there's that level, right? But that's sort of rattling around. And 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 many writers you talk to will say, you know what? That thing was rattling around my head for about two or three years before I could finally sort of get it out or even begin to put some sort of make some sense, of just two-dimensional sense out of it. Just rattle around in my head. So there's that level, right, that that's kind of going on. And then, you know, they do write the play, usually on their computer now. Very few people write longhand anymore, which I think is also an interesting thing about the way we think. Um, that um, my theory <coughs> is that because word processing has made sort of, you know, the regurgitation of words so easy, that we actually have plays that are kind of overwritten until you can kind of get and edit them back. You know, uh, when you had to write it in longhand, you had to make sure it counted. You know what I mean? It's an interesting thing about, right? So uh, then there's the writing sort of phase. And then there's somebody like me, or you know, or your best friend, or whatever reads and gives you a little bit of sort of sense of like what, what's beginning to kind of like heat, you know, like in the desert, kind of coming off the coming off the sand. Or and uh, then it gets to sort of a draft, like it's sort of mm, jello-y, right? It's starting to harden <coughs> a little bit. And to h actually put air underneath and around the ideas that are uh, being coded through words in a certain sequence and a certain rhythm, it gives you a really great sense of sort of like uh, the potential. Mm -hmm. Ideas particularly and character. So readings are just taking the page, and you're just going like that. You're just lifting it off the ground just a little bit. It's just just starting to, just starting to get the training wheels right. That's a reading to me. And then workshop if you have people walking around in space for like books in hand or something. It's the next right. You're just trying to get off on. The, you're on the runway. You're just trying to get up in the air. And so there are different levels of ways to do that. But this is vital. Workshop. Everybody says is more vital is is becoming vital. I think that may be true, but we've gone from here to throw all that stuff on there, right? You can do that, and um, so this this one can't be missed. Before I uh, invite our audience to ask you some of their own questions, I know that uh, you're familiar with James Lipton's program inside the Actors Studio, which this series is based on. So I know you must have anticipated that I'd be concluding the conversation with the questionnaire that he borrowed from Bernard Pivot's French television program, Lopez Straw. <laughs> so Louis, please tell us, what is your favorite word? <laughs> My favorite word? Hmm. Act one. <laughs> <laughs> what is your least favorite word? No. What turns you on, creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Well, boy, I, I get to spend most of my, my professional life in this mode because what turns me on is watching uh, either uh, an actor, or more, more actor, because I'm in a lot of rehearsal rooms, but watch them actually uh, connect the dots in a script and be able to carry it from one moment to the next and being willing then to share that. Um, to be a part of that process and to help support them. I mean, I, th I think playwrights and actors are quite remarkable people and um, have uh, extraordinary gifts to give to us. 
and should be honored that way. <coughs> um, uh, and I, I, I will also probably say that about playwrights. I was very proud of Tanya Siracho and the 10th Muse and how far she had gotten in terms of getting a, a lot of the kinds of materials that we had talked about, thematic materials. <coughs> what I'm talking about more specifically is that when you, you see the play, or if you see the play, you'll, you'll have a better sense of what I'm talking about, sort of the thematic materials in the play. But um, I'm ve I'm, um, I love to watch others have success. What turns you off? Well, you know, directors. <laughs> <laughs> With concept. With concept? <laughs> what is your favorite curse word? The F word. <laughs> There's a book about that, you know, it's the history of it, right? Yeah. Okay. What sound or noise do you love? Symphony. What sound or noise do you hate? Oh, those oh, car alarm things. <laughs> what, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Architect. Oh, come on, that makes sense. I've been talking about structure all damn night. <laughs> <laughs> what profession would you never like to do? Oh, waitress. <laughs> Or nurse, and you would not like me to do either one, right. so it's a good thing. And finally, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? You done good. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Louis Morgan Douthat. <laughs>
uh, and I knew who it was, so I wasn't doing it blind. Here was a woman of a certain age, my age, having this reflective moment at a time when I was having a reflective, you know, it like hit me at the, hit me at the right time. And that second act today, I don't know if you know the play, is still the best second act in the last 30 years of playwriting. I do not care. Tracy, let's step aside. <laughs> that that second act around that dining room table is so satisfying. In the way we've been talking about pieces and parts and components, I can't tell you exactly what the formula is, but you know it when you feel it, like symphony, right? And then equivocation, which was the third. And that was not a commission. It had been snuck under the door. I'm not kidding you. It was like, it was a mutual friend of Bill Rausch, who knew Bill Kane and thought that, and had had, had a part in developing it, I think. And he said, Bill, you've got to read this play. And Bill and I made a photocopy. And like, I think we both read it like that night, which is also extraordinary. Like, you know, somebody hands me, I was like, yeah, 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 I'll get to it. You know, four years later, right? <laughs> so we actually read it that night, and it was like this, Paige Turner. Who done it, right? The, the spirit of the who done itness. Who's there, right? It's a who done it. I mean, so there was that. Those are the three in 20 years. Got some excitement going on here in the front. Yeah. <laughs> no, no problem. Yes, back in the back. I'll, let me repeat the question before, so we can get it on the table. Oh, sorry. That's sure. okay. Yeah. Carolyn. So the question, the question has to do yeah, with. Good luck with that one. I know. The, very quickly, the question, the question is about um, the demise of Broadway turning into an entertainment center for commercial purposes and not developing new works. And does, it, does that affect, or what's your take on on that effect uh, regarding regional theaters developing new works? Well, naturally, I have a point. I have an opinion. <laughs> um, I'm let's shocked. just start. Yeah, I know. <laughs> let's just start with Broadway, right? Who said it wasn't supposed to be commercial? Do you know what I mean? I mean, from the beginning of time, really. Don't those Schubert's really cared about, like, art? <laughs> you know, so the fact of the matter is that some plays actually, straight plays, how are, make it on Broadway, I think that's the anomaly, right? And kind of extraordinary, too. And I think that would be great if it could. But boy, yeah. that, that is a complicated, that's a whole other animal, like how to negotiate in that world and the rules of and the unions of and the, I mean it's strange and it's sort of a uh, and it's an exclusive club too isn't it in an interesting way and there's some really fun things that happen spectacularly speaking and I think that there's joy in that I mean I, I, I want to do a who done it and I, I kind of want to do some sort of melodrama just for the sheer sort of emotional thrill of something do you know what I mean so that, that, that there's great value in that um, the, the, the thing about what's happening today, and it's so, uh, yes, uh, Broadway is very expensive. Bro and, and that is sort of a direct, like, that's what it costs to put on a show. You know, how do you break down those costs and how do you renegotiate with all those people to do all those things? Seems to me that there's plenty of people are willing to pay that amount of money. So until such time as that kind of breaks down, you're like, well, that's what you have to live with. But Gio, gee, I was in New York. I've been in New York a lot lately, the last two years. Because I'm developing a lot of work, everybody's in New York. And I mean, for 20 bucks, you can see some pretty damn good theater. Subsidized. All, it ain't Broadway, quote unquote. But holy moly, you know, for 200 of us or something, does it have to be with 1,500 of your, you know, your non-friends? You know, I mean, like, does scale, is scale the only thing that should matter? And I think not. I mean, really, I mean, they charged $20 for that crappy little show I did, you know, and I was like, oh, my God, I just came back from New York, and I spent $20, and it was like this amazing show. So, like, there's tons of money 
being, I feel, rerouted to subsidized theater, right? And th you can actually do pretty well. Ticket Central's one of them, and then there's a TKT. I mean, there's, there's, there are groups that you can kind of belong to to get really good prices on really fine plays, you know, in sort of a regional setting l in New York, for instance, right? So that's kind of fun. And of course, then there's the whole nonprofit uh, aspect of the regional theater movement, which was designed, oh, by the way, to create new works to take to Broadway. It was designed as the new play back in the day when it was being thought of because Broadway wasn't really doing it. So it's interesting. Now there's an interesting sort of an alliance that's happening between some commercial theater, and commercial theater in general and so the regional theater sort of using one or the other sort of R&D, you know, like um, La Jolla Playhouse is one of those places and to a certain degree um, I mean, we're developing things that we hope go elsewhere. Uh, do we hope it goes commercially? I mean, I expect in some ways equivocation going to Manhattan Theater Club is about as commercial as we've gotten so far, you know? Um, and there's these interesting sort of alliances that, that are happening because it takes a lot to put the components right to develop a play and particular musical. It's something like, you know, five to seven years to develop a musical. It's, it's three to four years to develop a play kind of thing, right? So um, there's a lot of different ways that these are, this is being sliced and sort of you know, um, addressed. Um, but I find it incredibly heartening now how many smaller you know, venues that there really are, particularly in New York and Chicago and in LA, where you can see damn good theater at a, at a reasonable price. So that said, on occasion, do I like to, uh, listen, I spent the $147 to see Cinderella. I mean, it was fun. It was a new book. You know, I justified it. It was a new book. But, um, and there was some social message in there. Yeah, <laughs> animal crackers, rah. So, because um, it's fun every once in a while. You know what I mean? So, I, I don't, it's not that I don't have high hopes about Broadway. It, it, it's never not been what it is. Oh, thank you for asking that question. It's about the Black Swan Lab. Uh, five years ago, um, well, actually seven years ago, we began to figure out, uh, tried to figure out how to add uh, a development wing uh, at the festival. And we brought in a consultant. Her name is Polly Carl, who's been instrumental uh, in shaping the conversation about new play and new play development in this country. And she's now at Emerson uh, College um, in that really uh, wonderful program. Uh, that is having a great effect, uh, you know, on the national dialogue. Um, and she was a head of the Playwright Center in Minneapolis at the time that we asked her to consult. And she saw instantly that the way to get things done at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival was to get on that production calendar. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen that production calendar. I've been here 20 years. I still can't <coughs> figure out that production calendar. It's got a lot of little boxes and a lot of little writing in there, and a lot seems to happen all at the same time. So, if, but if you could get it on there, it meant you get a budget. And if you can get a budget there, it's going to happen, right? So she saw that, and so she, we tried to figure out a way to um, carve out of an already very busy schedule, 780 performances, three theaters, you know, 100 actors, you know, you know the math, right? How are we going to add more work, you know, in sort of a, uh, a 13th production? Because we look at the Green Show as our 12th production, right? And so um, many, many, many years before, Scott Kaiser had the wise idea to sort of build uh, a little bit of production into once the 11 shows are up, that there's a little bit of a pocket of time. It seems like there's some actors that, yeah, yeah they're not working, you know, 12 slots a week. So um, sort of carved out some time. And then we did the Gibraltar. Had anybody seen Gibraltar? From, yes. Yeah, right? That, too, was a development where those eight actors were cast in the fall, it was like their third assignment. You know, every actor here has like two or three assignments and understudy, right? So it was their third assignment that they were going to spend something like five weeks together, a couple days a week, just the way the calendar worked out, you know, that they were free uh, from their other assignments and that they worked on Gibraltar for, for that amount of time. So from that, we took that model and we basically blew it up. And um, uh, what happens now is that the 11th shows up. As a matter of fact, I start tomorrow with the lab. It's the fifth year of it. Uh, and for the next three months, um, there are 16 actors who have been cast. And 
about four times a week whenever Liquid Plane is in performance. It's as if they were added to the cast of Liquid Plane. We're in New Place together, Reading Place. And they can be, some of them are our commissions, and some of them just somebody came on up I-5. I said, yeah, you got to play, great, come on. Um, and some of it is, there's a lot of uh, in-house writing going on. It's very moving to me. I'm uh, circling back to a lot of actors are writing and at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. So I was like, yeah, it's a lab. Come on, let's test it, whatever. And all we do is this. This is all we do is this. We don't walk around. We don't do anything. We eat a lot of snacks. Um, it takes a lot of energy to sit around and, and um, read and talk for four hours straight. You know. So the idea originally was how do we help the, with the development of our work. And I think we do. But what happened is that you all know that there's this moment in July when all the actors get, get the, the casting happens, right? You, you all know it's this big moment. And the lab was happening after all that. And then uh, the, any new work that was going to come into that next season, it's, it seemed really strange to try to work on it with not the cast that was cast, mm -hmm. right? That's just a little creepy. So you have to kind of go back a little, like two, two steps, like the first draft stage. Like, you want to hear it? Let's get 10 of your favorite, you know, your best friends. We'll sit around the dining room table and we'll read your play. It's that kind of thing, right? But what happened? So we do a lot of that. Like All the Way, for instance. As a matter of fact, when, um, you all see All the Way? Yeah. So when Robert Schenken came, he wanted to come into the lab. And why did he want to come into the lab? Because of the, the caliber of the actor that is attracted to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, sitting around a room reading his plays. And, and he wanted to ask the actors, with all their Shakespeare experience, what did it mean to be in a Shakespeare tragedy? How did it work? What does it feel like? And Robert Schenken also was an actor, by the way. Uh, and what did it mean to be a Shakespeare hero? And he had a couple of those guys that year who had played those roles, you know, the Othellos, the Lears, the Hamlet, which was kind of And one of our sessions was lit, sitting in a circle talking about Shakespeare and a tr tragic hero, right? Because he was equating that to LBJ, which I think there's, that's kind of easy in a way, right? So that was sort of fun too. But so we read things very early in development. Uh, we bring in a lot of uh, playwrights. And what's nice is they get to know us. We get to know them. Because we're here for 10 months at a time. And not, the actors aren't uh, so up on contemporary literature. They're really kind of, do, you know, they got to sort of do their baseball season, you know. Um, and so that's great. But the, the thing we didn't. Uh, calculate at all was the effect on the acting company who once I, I go through this whole structural conversation about like here's the job it's just looking at the where the pieces and parts are and, and how you fit in it it's actually not your job to carry the play the play is fine your job is just sort of enter and exit and pass along information at the time you're supposed to and like make sure the baton gets sent to the right guy in the right kind of tone and when I try to teach that to them, and that we equate that, you know, we usually use Shakespeare or we'll use a, a play already written. When they begin to sort of see the proportions of things, you could see the sort of relief on their faces. It's like, oh, I don't have to work that hard. It's like, yeah, you don't have to work that hard. Because the play should be doing the work for you. And that's how you know when a play still needs work, if the actors have to work too hard at it. You know what I mean? And of course, they're acting their hearts out, these actors, so it's hard to sometimes tell, you know, what's the thing that's not quite working or whatever. And they're so good. I mean, you know, they're making an arc of Cymbeline make sense, you know? <laughs> that's not easy, because it's there and it's complete, but holy moly, we, gotta, we all have to hold on. You know, it's like, oh my God, I'm juggling. So um, that has been the interesting thing for the actors, and so they've had a little, they get a little flexibility, and there's a, I'm choosing the place, so guess what? It's whimsical, it's eclectic, it's kind of like, well, oh, whatever, cavalier. Sometimes it's serious, but you know, it's really kind of like, let's, let's get in together and just play together. And so we all sit in a circle, no matter whether we're cast or not, and this play is in the middle of the room. And we just look at the play and we say, well, what is that made of? Oh, well, that's interesting. And that's how we talk to playwrights. So it's not... It's very objective, isn't it? I mean, you can't kind of say, well, the pl it's 66 pages long. That's a fact. Now, you want to fix the font like we used to do for our high school essays, right? <laughs> to make them look longer than they really were. And you could say it was 78 pages long. But it's still a fact. You know what I'm saying, right? So I try to look at the facts. 
and say, here's the fact. The fact of the matter is that person didn't speak for 45 minutes, and I forgot about her. Is that okay with you? <laughs> I don't know, if you see the 10th Muse, uh, there's a character who does not speak an awful lot. And you could almost forget about her at times. And as a matter of fact, we kept trimming more away from her. And I think uh, that the power of what she does at the end is even more surprising and more powerful because she has been a witness up until that point. And so that was delicious, right? You yeah. see what I mean? So that's what you kind of learn by just giving a little air because you, you don't hear the timbre of that voice, right? So that's what we've been doing, and it's a blast. Uh, logistics is a little complicated. A lot of people flying in, flying out, and I, on any given day, I'm like, what are we doing? Who is it? Well, this. But um, we're probably, in this season, oh, I bet there's at least two dozen playwrights who will be flown in. They will get to see the work. They will have an interaction. A very safe. It's not public. There's no public component to this. Sorry. Very safe, it's very incubator like, uh, and the playwrights don't know us very well, but they have to have a room that they can feel, you know, that there's trust. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we create. And, uh, Louis, thank you very much. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it.